Hello and welcome to our lesson on properties of functions. This is going to be from section 2.3 in our pre-calculus text. Let's get started. First, a generic overview of what we're going to cover. We're going to talk about how to identify when functions are even, odd, or neither, both in function notation and given the graph of a function. We're going to determine intervals where a function is increasing, decreasing, and constant, again given a graph of a function. We're going to find local and absolute maximum and minimum values given a graph of a function. And we're going to talk about finding the average rate of change, which it turns out is the same as the slope of the secant line given two values of x on a function. All right, first off, given a function, we have a test to determine if the function is even. It says if you substitute negative x into the function and get the original function back, then your function is even. For example, if we consider the function f of x equals x squared, substituting negative x in for x, would give us negative x quantity squared, which would actually be negative x times negative x, which would give us a positive x squared, giving the original function back. So again, this function is even because f of negative x produces f of x. Graphically, we can determine if a function is even if it has symmetry with respect to the y-axis. So again, if we look at the graph of f of x equals x squared, that would produce a parabola centered at the origin where we would have y-axis symmetry. If you reflect the right-hand side across the y-axis, it would lay on top of the left hand side. In other words, this graph is identical on the left and right of the y-axis. Next, we have a test to determine if a function is odd. If you substitute negative x into the function and it gives you the exact opposite of f of x, then that function would be an odd function. For example, if we're given f of x equals x cubed minus 5x, testing to see if this is odd, we would replace every x with negative x. And then working this out, we know negative x to the third would be negative x times negative x times negative x, which would produce a negative x cubed and negative five times negative x, negative times a negative would make a positive five x. Comparing this result to the original function, you will see that every term changed sign. In other words, this would be the same result as if you distribute a negative to the original function. So this verifies that this function would be an odd function. All right, using Desmos to look at the graph of this function, the way you can tell if a function is odd from its graph is if it is symmetric about the origin. Now that means if, if you look at what we have here, this graph from 0 to about 2.236 makes a, a, like a bottom hump here. If we take that hump and rotate it 180 degrees around the origin, it will lay on top of this hump here. So this graph is symmetric about the origin because it has rotational symmetry of 180 degrees about the origin. Next concept, we're going to talk about finding intervals where your function is increasing, decreasing, or constant. Here I've got a function example. I've used Desmos to sketch the graph. And we're going to look at a technique to find our answers. So what I want you to notice is that in this graph, there are three transition points. We're going to represent those as vertical lines. 
So we have a vertical line at negative 2. Notice this is a transition point because it changes from decreasing to increasing at that point. We also have another transition point at 0. Again, because we transition from increasing to decreasing. And we have another transition point at 3. That's going to be at 3 on the x-axis. And again, because we transition from decreasing to increasing. So when you're trying to find your intervals of increasing, decreasing, and constant, this is your first step. You need to draw vertical lines at every transition point. The next step is to label each section what it is doing. So this first section of graph is decreasing because it's going down from left to right. The next section of graph is increasing going up from left to right. Next section is decreasing again going down from left to right. And our last section of graph is increasing. Notice that this graph doesn't have any intervals of constant constant would be a horizontal line on the graph. So to find our intervals of increasing, we're going to look at our first increasing section. Okay, notice that this is increasing from negative 2 to 0. So that's why it's important that you label those vertical lines with the x that they intersect with because these numbers will be your intervals of increasing, decreasing, and constant. Now there is another interval of increasing over here. Notice that this is increasing to infinity. So this is going to be increasing from 3 to infinity. And depending on your instructions, they may ask you to use a comma. So we're going to say comma and our next interval of increasing is 3 to infinity. Notice that I didn't use any brackets. You never use brackets on increasing, decreasing, and constant. Next, our intervals of decreasing. We have a decreasing on the left. Notice that this is going to decrease all the way back to negative infinity. And since your intervals have to be represented from left to right, our first section of decreasing would be from negative infinity up to negative 2. And there is another section of decreasing. And that is from 0 to 3. So decreasing from 0 to 3. If they did have an answer for constant, you would just have to put none. There is no section of constant for this graph. All right, next I'm going to use the exact same function to discuss our next concept, which is local and absolute maximum and minimum values. So if we look at our graph, we can see on the ends that this graph is going to increase forever. So we can say that our absolute maximum is infinity the highest that this graph will ever be over the entire graph is infinitely high. The absolute minimum for this graph would be the lowest point that the graph ever gets to, and that point would be negative 15.75. Now for local maximum, the local maximum is talking about are there any hilltops in this area of the graph where all of the curves take place a local maximum would be a hilltop in this region we do have a local maximum because we do have a hilltop here at zero so the local maximum value would be zero and the local minimum would be any low points any low spots on the graph in this region and we can see that we do have two low spots on the graph in this region. So we're going to have two local minimum values. One is at negative 5.3 repeating. 
and the other is at negative 15.75. And that's the difference between absolute maximum and minimum and local maximum and minimum. Now the last concept we need to talk about is average rate of change and slope of the secant line. In general, the average rate of change of a function is the change in the y values divided by the change in the x values. Here, these are not just triangles. These are the Greek letter delta, which is used to represent change. There is a formula for average rate of change. It is f of x2 minus f of x1 divided by x2 minus x1. Now if you're thinking that looks familiar, it should, because back when you covered lines, specifically finding the slope of a line, that formula was y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And if you remember that f of x means y, you're going to see that these are basically identical formulas. Now there are other ways that this formula can be written. It could be f of b minus f of a divided by b minus a. It could be f of x1 minus f of x naught divided by x1 minus x naught. There's several different ways to set this up. What you need to understand is that you're going to be given an initial x value or a starting x value and a terminating x value. So the initial x value always comes last in the formula. The terminating x value always comes first in your formula. So now that we've got that part hashed out, we need to look at an example. Here we're given a function, f of x equals negative 2x squared plus 4. The instructions say calculate the average rate of change from 1 to 3. So the 1 would be our initial x, and the 3 would be our terminal x. I'm going to refer to these as x1 and x2. And then all we got to do is plug into the average rate of change formula. So that's going to be f of x2, which would be f of 3, minus f of x1 divided by x2 minus x1. Now to find f of 3 and f of 1, all you need to do is take those values plug them into the function and work it out. And if it's okay, I'm going to show all the work. For f of 3, we're going to have negative 2 times 3 squared plus 4. Again, all of that represents f of 3 minus f of 1 would be negative 2 times 1 squared plus 4 all over 3 minus 1, which is 2. And then doing the arithmetic, we have 3 squared, which is 9. 9 times negative 2 is negative 18 plus 4 minus 1 squared is 1. 1 times negative 2, negative 2 plus 4. Again, all over 2. Negative 18 plus 4 is negative 14. Negative 2 plus 4 is 2. That'll end up being minus 2 over 2, which is negative 16 over 2, giving us negative 8. So we can say the average rate of change from 1 to 3 for this function is going to be negative 8. Okay, so let's ask a different question. What if they asked me to find the slope of the secant line from 1 to 3. Guess what? All of the work is the same and this negative 8 would be your slope of the secant line. So please understand that if they ask you to find the average rate of change or the slope of the secant, both of those use the same formula. Now as a bonus, 
what we're going to do, since we know the slope of the secant line, we're also going to find the equation of the secant line. To find the equation of the secant line, we're going to use the point-slope form of a line. That's going to require that I know the slope of a line and a point on the line, which I do know. So if you recall, for this particular line, we were going from 1 to 3. So I could say that x1 is 1. To have a point on that line, I would also need to know y1, which is the same as f of x1, which would refer to this calculation here. If I show you the chain of events, f of x1 is y1, but f of x1 is the same as f of 1, which is this calculation. So finding y1, that's going to be this value, negative 2 plus 4, which is 2. And now I have a point on the line. I have the slope of the line. Now I can find the equation of the line. So that's going to be y minus y1 which is 2, equals m x minus x1, which is 1. And then if I put that in slope-intercept form, distribute the negative 8, bring the negative 2 over, negative 8x, that's going to be plus 8 and plus 2, gives me y equals negative 8x plus 10. And now what we're going to do is we're going to pull up Desmos and we're going to verify all of this information so far and give you a graphical representation of what we've done algebraically. All right, so there's one more piece of the puzzle that we need to come up with, and that is the other ordered pair. The x2 value was 3. We also need the y2 value that corresponds with that so that we have a second point on the line. And that calculation came from f of 3, which is this guy, which is this, which was negative 14. So this would be a second point on the line. Both of these points, not only are they going to be on this function, but they're going to be on our secant line, which we just found the equation to. So if we pull up our graph, notice that the first thing I have typed in is the function. We can see that our function is an upside down parabola. When they ask me to find the average rate of change from 1 to 3, what they're actually asking me to find is the slope of the line that goes through those two points. The average rate of change is the slope from point A to point B here. And I've typed in both of those ordered pairs. See, x is from 1 to 3, verifying that those points are on the graph. And then what I want to do is verify that this equation is correct. So if this equation for the secant line is correct, it should connect the dots on the graph. And it does. And that verifies that our negative 8 is the slope of the secant, but it's also the average rate of change from 1 to 3. And I believe that's going to do it for this particular lesson. So if you have any questions or comments about anything that I've covered, please feel free to leave those in the comment section below, or you can text me. And thanks for watching.